the, the idea that dinosaurs turned into birds is so stupid. It's almost, I can't think of anything dumber in right now at 2.30 in the morning or whatever time it is. It's dumb. I mean, like real dumb to think that a dinosaur turned to a bird. I know that was the deal with Jurassic Park. You know, the, they're flying off in the helicopter off the island and they look at the pelican and the guy's thinking, wow, that thing used to be a T-Rex. And that is just real, real stupid in my humble, totally unbiased and completely correct opinion on the topic. So one of the most relevant examples of evolutionary relationships many of us tend to marvel at or deny is the idea that avian tetrapods share a more recent common ancestor with living crocodiles than other reptiles, mammals, or other tetrapods. We know this from several genetic studies, but we must look at the fossil record and the resulting taxonomy of known transitionals to understand how one of the most diverse groups of vertebrates to exist on land could have changed so drastically from their closest living cousins. So birds and crocodiles are living representatives of the diapsiclade archosauria a sister clade to the lizard and tuatara clade Lepidosauria, and is distinguished by anatomical characteristics like skull finestra in front of the orbits and in the mandible, in addition to a prominent ridge in the femur known as the fourth trochanter. The first archosaurs to appear in the fossil records bring from basal archosauriforms, found in late Permian deposits, and after the large synapsids died out in the end Permian mass extinction, these archosauriforms diversified into the crocodile side of archosaurs through the clade Pseudosuchia, while the bird side of archosaurs began through the clade Ornithodira, represented by Sleromoclus, with its bird-like characteristics of having a tibia longer than its femur and elongated metatarsals, thus giving the synonymous name Avimetatarsalia. Avimetatarsalia diversified in the Triassic to give rise to the first pterosaurs, marked by their extremely elongated phalanges to stabilize their wing membranes. Basal dinosaur forms like Marasuchus also appear, marked by the appearance of the perforated acetabulum, the opening in the pelvic girdle through which the femurs attach, and this feature enabled these dinosaur forms to have a fully erect posture similar to mammals. From these dinosaur forms spawned the Stylosauric clade, the sister clade to the actual dinosaur clade, Dinosauria, whose earliest representatives in the late Triassic were small bipeds, differentiated by the shape of their pelvic girdle. One side of Dinosauria is the Ornithischians, named for their pelvic structure that resembles a modern bird's pelvis while the other side is the Sauritians, so named for their pelvic structure resembling a lizard's pelvis. We'll soon realize that these names are misnomers like many other taxonomic names, but they're still used due to the rules of phylogenetic nomenclature. We'll also see how the general body plan of dinosaurs, particularly theropods, are especially adaptable, so much so that many theropod groups will have quickly diversified into separate niches, allowing many groups to live at the same time, and often succeed well into the end of their reign. Because of this diversity, we'll only look at the forms that would appear as these splitting events occur, as opposed to using forms that would appear only later on to describe clades. This means that even though I might not mention certain dinosaurs like Carnotaurus, Spinosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, and Velociraptor, because they don't appear until sometime after their ancestors diverge, it doesn't mean that they don't fit in their proper places in clades that we form. So in the beginning of the late Triassic, early Ornithischians like Eocursor competed with early Sauritians like Alwarcaria and Eoraptor, which later diversified into basal theropods like Herrerasaurus, Eodromaeus, and Tawa, in addition to early sauropodomorphs like Wybosaurus. While the sauropodomorphs had diversified into the clade Plateosauria by the end of the Triassic, then into the large actual sauropods throughout the following Jurassic period, the theropods had diversified with them to such a large degree that nearly all major groups of theropods were represented by the end of the Jurassic period with the first clade forming as Neotheropoda, led by the late Triassic Coelophysis, which marked the beginning of the clavicles fusing to form what would become the avian furcula, also known as the wishbone, plus the loss of the fifth digits of their hands and feet. The Neotheropods are then divided between Coelophysoidea and Averostrans, characterized by having a promaxillary fenestra and the loss of the massive kink between the promaxilla and maxilla that the Coelophysoids like Coelophysis and Dilophosaurus retained. Avirostrans then split into the sister clade Ceratosauria and Tetanurae, while the Ceratosaurus like Elaphosaurus began to get their digits and arms reduced and later developing head crests and horns like in Ceratosaurus. The Tetanurans gained larger arms and hands and stiffer tails. Soon afterwards in the Jurassic, the basal Tetanurans further diversified into the clade Orionites, which consists of the Megalosauroids like Eustreptospondylus and the Avitheropods. It's within the Avitheropod clade that Carnosauria appears, which includes the top dog of the Jurassic, Allosaurus. As a sister clade to Carnosauria, Silurosauria is the clade of avitheropods that are marked with having the most bird-like characteristics. Besides the relatively nondescript basal most Silurosaurus like Zulon, Silurosauria encompasses the clade Tyrannoraptora, consistent of the Jurassic Tyrannosauroids and their Cretaceous counterparts. Tyrannoraptora also includes basal Manoraptors like Scipionix, Ornitholestes, and Compsognathus. From these Jurassic basal Manoraptors bring the clade Manoraptoriformes, first represented in the late Jurassic by Alvarosauroids like Hapacarus 
and the scansory opterigids of the clade Aviraptora, represented by the late Jurassic remains of Taurodontids and the clade Aviale, the group that contains the whole of creatures that most people would actually consider to be birds, marked by having fully fledged flight feathers. Because of the feathers' prevalence in these avialins, it's thought that the earlier forms of feathers had to be present in practically all theropods in some form or another, perhaps serving the purpose of insulation at first, as later forms like this oviraptorine theropod would show. The earliest avialins would include Aurorus, Inchiornis, Sialtingia, and Archaeopteryx in the late Jurassic, succeeded in the early Cretaceous by Jehalornis and Shixionornis, marked by having more powerful flight adaptations like a fused skeleton and smaller size than the avialins preceding it. Shixionornis is basal to the clade U. aviale and is the sister taxon to the clade A. B. brevicata, containing the family Omnivoropterygidae, serving as a transitional set between the long-tailed avialins and the clade Pygostylia. Characterized by having a pygostyle, a fusion of the tail vertebrae resulting in a shorter tail than the reptilian tails of the previous avialins. By this time, the pelvic structure of the pygostyleans have allowed the nearly complete reversal of the pubic bone, forming the modern avian pelvis. Clade pygostylia is split between the sister taxa based on the shape of the pygostyle, with the family of Confuciusornis having a rod or ribbon like pygostyle, while the ornithothoraces begin to shorten their plowshare shaped pygostyle, in addition to exhibiting flight enhancing skeletal modifications like the alula. Carpal metacarpus, tarsal metatarsus, and a longer sternum. Confucius Sornis is also one of the first birds to have a toothless beak, but this is thought to be an instance of convergent evolution rather than a homologous trait for aves, because its beak does not allow for the sort of motion that modern birds can do with their beaks. This beak kinesis, as it's called, doesn't appear until later. Within Ornithothoraces, two clades spawn in competition throughout the Cretaceous, with not just each other, but with the Cretaceous counterparts of previous dinosaur groups. One side is the clade Ananciornithis, resembling very much like modern birds besides having a different sort of pectoral anatomy, while the clade Euornithis is based upon forms like Archeorhynchus and Gianchingonis that lost the feathers on their back legs that previous avialins would have had. Within Euornithis, the clade Ornithomorpha shows a progressively semi-aquatic lifestyle appearing, up to the basal branches of Ornithurae, represented by the late Cretaceous Hesperornis and ichthyornis, marked by their pygostyle becoming shorter than the femur, the formation of a sin sacrum, a keel on their sternum, and losing more of their digits, up until we finally get to the crown clade of living birds, aves, appearing and diversifying just before the end of the Cretaceous with their fused tibiotarses and fully toothless beaks with their kinetic ability. Bird classification continues to be contentious as DNA evidence has yet to come in to resolve every major group of birds, but the evidence we do have of the biggest groups of birds using representative species do give us a clearer picture than we would without, because birds are obviously just as adaptable as their dinosaurian predecessors were. Within the crown clade aves, there is an immediate fort between the paleonates and the neonates. The paleonates encompass most of the flightless birds like ostriches, the now extinct elephant birds and moas, and the tinamu, among others, all appearing throughout the paleogene and neogene periods. The neonates are then split between the galloanserae and the neoaves. The former includes the galliforms, ground birds like turkeys and chickens, and the anseriforms, waterfowl like geese and ducks. Neoaves is split further into Columbia, which includes flamingos, dodos, and pigeons, and passeria. Passeria consists of the basal clades otidae, bustards and cuckoos, gruae, hotsons, cranes and rails, and ardea, which includes tropic birds, kegu, and the aquiornithes like herons, pelicans, boobies, and penguins. Ardea is the sister clade to teller aves, which then consists of the sister clades aphroaves and ostoaves. The afro aves side contains many birds of prey like owls, raptors, and vultures, in addition to mouse birds, woodpeckers, and toucans. The austral aves side consists of the basal now extinct terror birds like forest racos and the clade U. falconomorphae, which includes falcons, parrots, and the final major clade passeriformes, which is so diverse that about half of all living bird species we know have fallen into this clade. Things like crows and the wide variety of songbirds like warblers, sparrows, and tits. Thus, we very briefly uncovered the true biodiversity that birds encompass from having a body plan that is adaptable for almost every niche imaginable, inherited from a body plan that is inherently dinosaurian in origin, going through massive changes in their anatomy to accommodate the flight that they have perfected since the Jurassic period, amidst their non-avian dinosaur cousins, and all other tetrapods since the Mesozoic era. Of course, all of taxonomy is provisional, and there is no shortage of controversy in the specifics of bird classification. One of the largest birds discovered, Pelagornis, is particularly enigmatic, but the evidence we do have only indicates that birds are very derived forms of dinosaurian archosaurs with the remarkable ability to adapt for nearly all sorts of environments as they competed with both the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic fauna that evolved along with them. Birds did not come from dinosaurs. You can tell them sweetly. Kent Hovind says that is stupid. And if they believe birds came from dinosaurs, I have got a bridge I want to sell them. Uh, please have them give me a call on that. Okay.